So we delve more deeply into the mystery of Christ today in this feast. Already in the first reading, we see this mysterious personage with which Jesus is identified, uh, Melchizedek. He only appears, you know, this, this, in this very short passage in the book of Genesis. And then, of course, the psalm that we had today, this famous psalm, uh, speaks about the Messiah being in the order, of, seems to be a messianic, messianic king in the order of Melchizedek. The letter to the Hebrews has a fairly long section or commentary on this about Jesus's priesthood, about not being the ordinary kind. And he, it takes one of the legends about, the Jewish legends about Melchizedek. First of all, he was king of righteousness, that's what his name means, Melchizedek, king of Salem, peace, the letter points out, and says, no mention is made of his father or mother. So it says he was without father and without mother with, a be with no beginning of life or end of days. And so that was compared to, to Jesus, his mysterious well, divinity, his generation, before, like the dew before the day star, as the psalm says. Hmm? But of course, that's not the full Jesus whom we know, this divine figure. It's the human figure who leaves us precisely his body and blood. The Council of Trent has a very lapidary phrase about, you know, the Eucharist that we have the whole Jesus. We have divinity, soul, body, and blood. But indeed, you know, the body and blood are what are emphasized in the feast. And it's a reminder that Jesus accompanies us in his humanity. He's, he pledged to be with us at the end of Matthew's gospel to the end of the world. And he could have, he could have done that by, you know, di directing us from on high or inspiring us or even walking at our side would be really great. But he doesn't. He enters into us. He becomes us. Or we become him, if you will the body of Christ. And he shares his whole, not just his being, his human existence, but his, his ex human experience. As the opening, this famous opening prayer says that we use at benediction, it says, you know, that you left us your sacrament uh, as a memorial of your passion. We often say that the, the Mass is a, is a representation of Calvary is, is Jesus crucified, but also, of course, we must not forget Jesus risen, as he really is present now, as he is. So his whole human experience is there in the Eucharist. His whole, uh, his, his life, his death, and his resurrection to accompany us in our life and death and resurrection. That's how he's with us, but he's with us within us transforming us into himself so that gradually, hopefully, we can say, as St. Paul does, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ continues his incarnation, if you will, within us. As St. Teresa of Jesus said, you know, he has no hands but ours now, and no, no feet but ours to go and preach the gospel. So that's an incredible uh, reality, that we, we are the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you ask anybody who the body of Christ is, what the body of Christ is, they'd say the Eucharist, right? But it's equally correct to say it's us. We are the body of Christ. The famous uh, Jesuit cardinal theologian Henri de Lubac, uh, uh, who was a great scholar of the Middle Ages and the fathers of the church, said, you know, in, in, in those days in the Middle Ages, when you spoke about the mystical body of Christ, the mysterious body of Christ, it was the Eucharist, not us. And if you meant the real body of Christ, the real presence of Christ, it was us. Not, first of all, the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist is only there to make us the body of Christ. That's all it's for. All. It's just there to make us into the body of Christ, for Jesus to share his own life, death, and resurrection with us. It's important to remember that, for example, when we adore the Blessed Sacrament and have benediction and have, have the monstrance and all of that, you know. As the Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner reminded us, even in, the, even in, the, in, the, in, the, in that adoration of the Eucharist, Christ is there to be eaten. That's why it's bread. 
If Jesus wanted just to be looked at, he would have become a diamond or an emerald or something like that. But he is there precisely to be eaten and to become us, to become part of us so that we become part of him, that we become him. We become the body of Christ. That's the marvelous thing, that he shares his very own being and life with us, his body with, with us. And he does, us, he does this to accompany us on the way so that we can pass successfully through our own trials, our own life, our own death, and then into our own resurrection. That's an, a, a most marvelous, and he's there precisely, you know, in that, well, how does he present it? It's a wedding banquet. It's a banquet, it's a feast. He's there to celebrate a feast with us, the feast of life, even the feast of death, if you like, the feast of death and resurrection, the feast of the marriage feast of Christ and his church. That's what all the parables about the wedding banquet are about, wedding feast of Canaan, the man who gave a banquet for everybody. It's to remind us that his relationship with us is a banquet of love. That's how he's there with us, in a banquet of love that lasts for all eternity. The book of Revelation that presents the, 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 uh, the, the, the reality of heaven as, as a bride coming down adorned to meet her husband. That it's an eternal wedding feast, that kind of intimacy. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should relish that, literally relish that. We should love that as he loves us, sharing so intimately with us. He shares his own body with us. He becomes one body with us. We become one body with him and in him. Isn't that a marriage? Becoming one body? All right. What could be more intimate than that? Well, as St. Paul says as well to the Corinthians, whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We share everything with him, body and spirit. We share one reality with him. And it's that kind of intimacy which we should be able to celebrate, that we become one body with Christ forever. And then we become one body with one another because we are all the body of Christ. And if he nourishes us, literally with his own life, to guide us on our way, we should nourish one another with our own lives, be bread for the world, as is, as is said, in Christ, because it's Christ doing that in us. Christ is giving himself to others in and as and with us all to form one body of Christ, so that all may be one as you, Father, in me, and I in you, that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me, because if we are not one and strive to make, to share ourselves with all, why should the world believe that we have anything to offer? But if we really let Christ become one with us, and we become one with him, and do not shy away from that incredible intimacy and presence, then we have something really to share with one another. It makes our lives a banquet of joy, and we can make one another's lives a banquet of joy if we are able to live out our true identity as Christ, the body of Christ. We become one with Christ. We have the mind of Christ. It's Christ who lives and acts in us. We are utterly transformed. Not as we transform food into ourselves, but this one transforms us into it, as has often been said. So let's make sure when we, quotes, go to communion, that it really is communion. Communion it really is a sharing of life. Not just for a moment, but constantly, and at a transformative, healing, magnificent sharing of life that we can then share as well with others. That is how Christ is with us. That's what the Eucharist is for, and that's how it works, and that's what it means. So let's live it to the full, and not just one tiny part of it, but that whole deep, intimate, universal mystery of Christ's humanity and divinity in which he calls us to share. Mm.